Hey guys, welcome back to Home Built, and in this episode, we are going to tear into the Ferrari engine. All right, guys, welcome back. And those watching last week would have seen that I did the paint protection film on the front of the Alpha with mixed results, but I got better as I went. Uh, I definitely have much more of an appreciation now of what it takes to actually get the uh, uh, the paint protection film on there. Uh, it's yeah, it can be finicky, but I think it's well worthwhile and uh, uh, definitely should keep the bulk of the car looking looking really nice. Um, basically, most of the forward-facing areas are going to have it, so it should uh, withstand most of the damage and the uh, carnage I'm going to uh, <laughs> make it face, because I'm going to drive it. But before I drive it, I have to move forward and uh, get this Ferrari engine ready to put into the car. So um, a few more details on this engine because uh, people obviously haven't necessarily seen all of the 150 odd videos on this series, but this engine is a uh, 2000 model Ferrari 360, 3.6 litre V8 uh, that came out of a wreck car out of Japan. There's an auto wrecker in South Australia here, GT Auto Spares, who has a heap of engines, everything from sort of 488 engines through to, you know, 355. Like you've got, got every type of Ferrari engine, Porsches, McLarens, whatever you can think of, exotic cars, they've got a massive warehouse and they've got heaps of stuff there. Um, the cost wise of the engine, uh, one of the reasons I actually went with the Ferrari engine on this build is, is A, I thought it would be something really cool. I really love these engines. It's a really, it's a really revy engine. Um, revs to uh, standards about 8,700 RPM, but uh, apparently the Challenge Stradale is basically the exact same engine that revs to about nine and a half, and a lot of people take it up to that. I'll probably try and keep it about 9,000 RPM or something like that as the uh, red line. And uh, when we get on the dyno, we'll see what we can actually do with it. Um, these, these engines are, are quite reliable and as I said, cost wise, this was much cheaper than rebuilding my 911 engine by, by a magnitude. It, it like, yeah, it, it is, it is amazing how much you can spend on rebuilding engines. And even if I was going to rebuild the original engine, um, with some sort of, uh, hot up parts, I could easily, easily get to the cost of this. And when you think that I bought this engine with a bunch of bits that I'm not gonna use that I can resell, um, it made this make a lot of sense. So it's not you know, as crazy, as ex expensive as you would imagine. Um, but before I put it in the car, obviously there are a few things to do. Although you've seen in the past that I painted the plenum covers and this engine's been sitting around, it's filthy. Um, I've done a lot of machining work. Obviously, I cut these runners down and uh, uh, all that. So I was looking at how I want this engine to look in the car. Obviously, this is going to be uh, basically the engine bay is going to be like a jewelry box. It's just going to be completely clean except for the engine sitting in the middle of the engine bay, uh, which is what I went for with this car. So I want it to look nice. So I'll bring you down here now so you can sort of see what I'm thinking as far as uh, making this thing look as good as it can. All right, so ignoring the lifting chains, um, this entire engine, all you're gonna see from of the engine is about from this height, so the edge of the rocket covers up. You're not gonna see anything lower than that because it's just tucked right deep into the car. Um, so that's the part that I'm concentrating on making look the part. So uh, the front, we've got these plastic covers, they'll stay as they are. Uh, we have the inlet runners here. So the inlet runners on this engine, um, I did shorten down because I had to shorten this whole plenum down to sit under the bonnet as far as I could because otherwise it would just stuck out way too far. Um, by shortening that, I have changed the performance slightly, but it's actually um, not as much as you might think. So you can see all these bell mounts here and for this runner here and for this cylinder, the inlet air actually comes from here. So it comes into this inlet here, runs in across, 
and down into the engine. And then at higher RPM, uh, the butterfly inside this, uh, this run here, they open on either side and then the air can uh, sort of mostly bypass this and just go straight in. So it gives a sort of a variable inlet runner system to, uh, to sort of make the most out of the, uh, the available torque from the inlets. I have messed with this by shortening this here, but on the scheme of things, I haven't actually shortened it a great deal. Not as much as what, percentage wise, as what people think, but yes, I will have messed it up. There was little choice in this matter. But because I've shortened this, if we actually zoom in, because I've shortened this, I've considered all different types of methods to uh, try and make this all match. But I think the, the best option to make all of this look even is to paint it. The issue I was always gonna have, it's a different level of shine to the rest of this area. I briefly considered doing dry ice blasting. But the issue I find with dry ice blasting is it's extremely expensive. Just the dry ice itself is extremely expensive um, for something that is basically just for a thorough clean. And it still wouldn't make this all match together. Now I think the job is to strip this all apart uh, as, as sort of get rid of most of the bits and pieces I can, put it on the engine stand, and then we need to look at cleaning it. So you can see here I'm using an old bracket to brace the flywheel so I can unbolt it. It took me several attempts to work out how to bolt the engine stand bracket to the engine, but I got it in the end using the adapter plate. All right, so the engine is now on the engine stand. I had to play around a bit to get it to uh, fit on. I uh, ended up finding that it uh, really needed to be on with the, mounted to the adapter plate. It was too hard to mount it up to the engine itself. Um, and uh, I had actually marked out earlier that I needed to clearance this ear on the, uh, on the engine because that's where my steering shaft goes. As uh, you all know, this is a very tight fit in the car and that needed to be clearanced to actually get the, uh, the, this, the, the knuckle of the steering shaft. Uh, just really nice, clear, clean play. Uh, so I've done that now. It's now time to strip off the rest of the bits on the engine and uh, maybe even get out the pressure washer and see what I can do about cleaning up some of this as good as we can get it. So once I've unbolted all the accessories, I make sure I cover up any of the openings into the engine and give it a thorough degreasing. And then I go around with a wire brush and an old toothbrush and uh, scrub it all and get it all looking nice and neat before I hit it with the pressure washer. All right, so I've stripped this all back and given it a bit of a clean up. You can see that there's quite a bit of corrosion in here uh, in where the belts are from sitting for a long time. And I'm going to obviously go through now and, uh, and try and tidy it up and give it a bit of a service. So um, these belts aren't staying. I've got a bunch of uh, service parts from Eurocar Garage. But for the time being, I think I'm gonna take the rocker covers off and uh, let's just have a look inside and see what the cams look like.
All right, so uh, having a look along the cams, um, all the lobes, they look nice and clean. I can't feel anything on my uh, on my fingers. It looks like there's a lot of hardening on there. I assume that's what that, uh, all, all that coloration is, but uh, yeah, it's all nice and clean inside. But um, initial inspection, all looks reasonably neat and tidy. And before I cover this up, I just thought I'd, uh, I'd like to go through these cams. Um, it's actually quite interesting because I have never actually seen cams like this before where they've got these angled lobes. This is a five valve per cylinder engine. So there's one, two, three lobes for the intake side of this cylinder and there's two valves below. Now the lower valves are regular straight cam lobes. But if you notice these top lobes, um, they're actually on, a, on an angle. They're, they're tapered lobes. The inside lobe is straight and the outside lobes are on an angle. And I assume that's because the, uh, the angle of each of the valves are coming down from either side. And it's, uh, yeah, it's quite an interesting quirk that I haven't seen before. Maybe it's common on, uh, on other engines, but uh, I haven't seen it. So I'm just going around with some wax and grease remover and cleaning up uh, a bunch of the, the areas before I can paint it and also trying to get a bit of that surface rust off of those uh, timing belt pulleys. So once I take off the cam cover, you can see I'm going around here with a razor blade and very carefully without scratching the surface, taking off any excess gasket and sealant to uh, make a nice clean mating surface. Same again here, getting rid of any excess gasket. And here I'm just masking up the bits that I don't want to paint. Alright, I've been working on this for a while, I've been going backwards and forwards on what I'm going to do and uh, what bits I'm going to touch up while I'm not. Uh, I've decided that what I'm going to do is I'm going to be painting the, the block, the centre of this uh, area in an aluminium paint. It's easier to do it in a paint to make it nice and smooth and even, keeping it looking roughly like it's supposed to, just keeping it nice and neat and tidy. I think that's a good option for, uh, for my case. Uh, some of you might li like it, but uh, I think it'll be good. I've cleaned this all up now. I've masked up the bits that I don't want to paint. Um, some of the other bits I'm not too concerned about. I'm getting new belts on it and uh, uh, other bits and pieces. So I'm just going to give this a quick hit of silver in the middle now, and then we can start moving on to some of the other bits and pieces that I'm going to be cleaning up. So I'm quite happy with that. Just a light dusting over the whole thing just gives it, just freshens it up a little bit and makes it look uh, neat and crisp without going overboard. Um, as I said, I, I wasn't worried about belts and things like that. I've got uh, replacements for those. So uh, now that is done, I'm going to take the rocker covers off because these are going to get painted thoroughly, which means pulling these off and uh, and then I'll cover the engine up, wrap it up so that it doesn't get any uh, contaminants on it while it's uh, sitting here exposed and we'll uh, start working on the rocker covers. So now I've masked off the cam covers, I'm going over them with the DA and uh, 80 grit sandpaper. Just to take all of the wrinkle surface off and to get a nice prep surface for painting.
All right, rocket covers are all sanded back now. Uh, just went to town on with 80 grit, got rid of the uh, the wrinkle coat. There is still little tiny bits in the corners, which uh, uh, hopefully the primer filler, which I'm about to attack now, will cover up. And uh, yeah, so let's go and mix up some paint and put some uh, primer filler on these. And then uh, we should be looking good towards getting this engine looking schmick. Okay, so the rocker covers are uh, in the booth at the moment with the primer on them. Uh, so I have to leave them for a week or so. The engine is uh, is looking good. I am, it's always daunting tackling these things and I've taken a while sort of going through, working out how I'm going to do each part, putting things on and taking them off. And uh, so it's been a lot of time that you haven't really seen on camera, but it's been a couple of days going through all the bits and pieces. I'm quite happy with the uh, the progress so far. But that is all I've got time for this week, so I think that means it's time for Fun Facts with Mrs. Jeff. Hey guys, in 1989, Ferrari replaced the 328 with the new 348 TV and TS. Named in a similar manner to its predecessor, the 34 for the 3.4 litre engine, and the 8 for the V8. The TB and TS was for transversal Berlinetta and transversal Spider, and for the transverse gearbox or roof or targa option. The 348 styling was taken from various models, with the strakes and rectangular taillights taken from the Testarossa, and some of the front end taken from the F40. 3.4 V8 was fitted with two Bosch Motronic ECUs, running like two four cylinders, making 300 horsepower. In 1983, the Ferrari Challenge was initiated by Hans Hugenholtz from the Netherlands, which were lightly modified 348s. 93 also saw an update with the modified 348 GTB, GTS and Spider, which saw a bump to 320 horsepower. And the Spider was actually the first production convertible since the Daytona Spider. A limited run of 50 348 GT competiciones were built, including eight right-hand drive. These had a bunch of carbon Kevlar components and a polycarbonate rear window, which in total resulted in a dry weight of 1,180 kilos. All right, um, yes, that was the daunting task this week of tackling the Ferrari engine, but I'm glad I got in there, uh, starting to sort of have a look at it, make sure everything is nice and making it prettier. So when it goes in the engine bay, it's gonna be nice and tidy. I've still got a bunch of servicing to do, which I'll uh, get stuck into next week. And hopefully I can finish painting those uh, rocker covers and stuff. So when we put it back in the engine bay, it will all be pretty, pretty. and neat pretty. and tidy. Yeah, pretty. Hey, we've used the word pretty so many times in a short period of time, but I, I like this, I like this very much. Like and subscribe and let Jeff know what you think. Yep. And if you want to help him out, Patreon is would be awesome, and you get to see the videos a day early with no ads. Yep. Other than that, I think that is everything. Yes, us. Oh, uh, check out, I'll put a link uh, in the description. I've started doing a podcast for those who are interested with a friend of ours, um, Spike. It's the Build and Drive podcast where I'm the builder, as many of you would get. And uh, Spike is the driver who's a uh, uh, ex-FIA European Formula 3 driver and uh, Super Trofeo and a bunch of other things. So we... Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a pretty misguided uh, little podcast that we just uh, ramble on a bit. So those who are interested, I'll put a link <laughs> to the, uh, the, the YouTube channel and uh, we, we'll uh, have it on all the podcast platforms. So check it out, the Build and Drive podcast. Awesome. If you want more rambling, that's the place to go. Yeah, <laughs> I'm good at rambling. <laughs> <laughs> all right, guys, we'll see you next Bye, time. Guys. Hey, guys. In 1989, Ferrari replaced the 348 with the new 328 TB and TS. No. And for the transverse gearbox and covert net lever. And some of the rear end was also taken from the front of the F40. What? <laughs> <laughs> it's just so bright. I can't what? see anything. I'm blinded. <laughs> Eyes are watering. It's so bright. Okay. Making 300 horsepower, running like two cylinders. <laughs> no. Bosch Motronic ECUs, running four, like two cylinders. <laughs> Running two four cylinders. <laughs> a limited run of 50, 348 GT. These had a bunch of carbon kit there. <laughs>